I'm really privileged to introduce the special session today. Uh, we're having two presenters, Stefan and Tim, coming to join us. And we don't have a session after this, so we have plenty of time for Q&A at the end of the half hour. And then we give you back a little bit of time. Or if you want to go on to another session for a half an hour before lunch, you're welcome to do that as well. But now I'm going to ask you to please put your hands together to give our presenters a warm welcome. Thank you. Right on. Well, thank you to uh, everyone for coming to listen to us today. Obviously, there's lots of great breakout sessions over the next few days, so we appreciate um, your time. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about co-creation um, and how the University of Kingston is doing some redesign and some piloting uh, a few different things to really drive engagement at the, at the university. So um, as was mentioned, I'm Stefan Forche. I'm the UK Regional Director at Instructure. Tim, you want to go ahead and just give yourself a quick... Yes, yeah, so I'm Head of Technology and Arts Learning at Kingston mm -hmm. University, and, and we use a campus on Instructure. Yeah, and right on. So just for quick context for anyone, um, Instructure is the company who makes Canvas uh, BLE. We started out making Canvas in...
Oh dear. <laughs> Sorry, if I, I'm stepping too far away from the. Uh... No, it's okay. You just got the microphone. Yeah. Brilliant. So we came to the pandemic. Now that that structuring and all that work we did with learning design helped helped us. It did help us flip to the uh, the fully online. And what was interesting for us, what's been interesting, is you know this was the pre-pandemic year 2019-20. This is just page. This is just page views. It's not activities. It's a number of page views uh, by students. And of course, we really jumped in 2021. We did see us drop down again in in 21-22. What was interesting to us, the academic year that's just finished, is our usage actually is the highest ever and actually double the, the, the pandemic, uh, pre-pandemic year, which is really interesting to us, how big a jump that was. And in one regard, the use of the VLE has, has you know, has not, it's not backed off. You know, we've continued the growth. The problem for us and which isn't in that chart, is the active engagement. So students contributing, editing, uh, discussing, those numbers have been dropping off. And that's been, a. they grew during the pandemic, during the lockdown and online, they grew. Subsequently, they've been dropping off. And what we're doing now in terms of flip canvas is trying to uh, work with staff to reverse reverse that. So, um, so yes, we active active engagement declined, discussions, groups, quizzes, editing pages. We were looking at institutional-wide analytics. Um, also giving us an indication of usage of those tools, how many students were actually contributing to discussion at an institutional scale. They were giving us that sort of picture. And we were really interested in this balance between synchronous and asynchronous. You know, a lot of what happened during the pandemic was synchronous learning activities. As much as we were trying to encourage staff to really take advantage of the online medium for asynchronous, allow that time for student reflection in terms of contributing, flexibility when they can contribute and so on. I think we got out of sync with that balance between synchronous and asynchronous. And just on that as well, I think that the the synchronous versus asynchronous balance goes back to what we were talking about. I have to remember that. About all the tech now. Right? <laughs> I wonder what's going to come through the door. <laughs> going to have an Oculus go in. Um, just that balance of activities. They say synchronous versus asynchronous. This is something that we're hearing all the time as it relates to the, like I said, the research at the start, where the students need that convenience and that flexibility. That the synchronous is not always um convenient for them within their schedule right so that mm. focus on asynchronous activities is, is coming more and more to the to the forefront and of course and i, I haven't got too much time but everybody knows the impact then of the ofs uh independent review of blended learning and then the ofs restating uh you know the various criteria that's had an impact on us as a university and our strategy then towards online so that's the sort of challenge we were uh, facing. Um, so um, what we're trying to do now, we've started this project called Flip Canvas. And what we're trying to look at is, trying to, we are, um, focus on students and staff co-creating within the VLE. Um, we are doing a lot of work, of course, currently on digital capabilities. And we are trying to address artificial intelligence and what the impacts there. We're trying to bring all three together as part of this as part of this program. So that's the sort of challenge we've got. Um, so we've um, we're we're running a series of pilots. We've got around twelve uh, modules participating at the moment. Actually, I think we've got a few more. We've had further interest. So. But we've already started working with these uh, with these module teams. Uh, the, the purpose is that the the idea is that the modules that we have become more student centered, more co created. You know, we've been reviewing. We've done some detailed learning analytics. We have time at the end. I can tell you some of the things that we've done. But 
trying to move the balance from very staff centric content heavy modules to where students have control they co we're trying to situate the co-creation between you know that active engagement and student partnership you know this active engagement great student partnership we we have programs in the university student partnership but subsets of students the co-creation here within canvas modules we're looking at encompassing that whole cohort um um so we've done this learning as a part of the baseline for all the modules that are involved we've done a we've done a deep dive in the learning analytics we've reported back to the module teams what we've seen what we've seen about how their learning design is working how all students are navigating through those modules are they following that learning design or are they not and that's proved really interesting um And so some of the things that we're looking at is one of the things we can do in Canvas, I'm sure with other VLEs, but certainly within Canvas, uh, Canvas is effectively a Canvas module is like a, a wiki in some regards, and we can devolve edit rights to pages. So the main areas for content within the, within the modules, we can devolve edit rights to students. So that's a key tool in our armory is working with staff. I mean, it's to hand over control of some of the module to students. Um, and it's something we're doing collaboratively. We, it's nothing we're imposing, we're having discussions and we have some really interesting discussions with, um, with staff. It is promoting the, the affordance of asynchronous, you know, the students, the, the flexibility of time and space, but also that time to think and reflect rather than that instant response in the chat, the chat environment. Um, Looking at, you know, we've had discussion boards. We've actually had discussion boards at Kingston. I remember our first discussion, I've been at Kingston a long time. I shouldn't admit to this. I remember actually implementing our first discussion boards in 1994. We've had them over a quarter of a century. It seemed very old fashioned, but actually the potential of them is, is great. And we've got, we've got some new social media elements built in. And then the last thing we're working with the teams is building in AI seeded, seeding AI activities as part of the as 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 part of this. And I, if, if we've got time, I've probably gone on too long. I can quickly uh, show you. So, um, oh well, this <laughs> here's an example. So this was we'll, we look. We're having lots of discussions. We're running weekly briefing sessions with staff on on how to approach generative AI. I'm not going to talk about that now. But we're, we're, we're sort of modeling various activities that staff can easily Im implement within the VLE. One thing here is taking a, a, a discussion, putting a discussion topic up for students and then um, generating an AI response to that discussion and then getting students to respond to the initial discussion topic, but also to the AI, resp to the AI response and critiquing that, starting to develop the sort of evaluative judgment skills, you know, it, and considering not just, you know, of themselves and others, but of the AI output. So we're, we're working through examples of doing that with, uh, with staff. And then the other benefit of actively engaging students, actually editing and contributing to the Canvas modules is helping with our digital capabilities because they are editing within the system. We're getting them to assess the accessibility of the resources they're generating but also bringing up the HTML views and looking at the pages they're putting together, looking at the HTML. So again, it's building in the digital capabilities as, as, as well. So, um, so where we are at the moment, uh, pilot module stages, we've done, we've been doing the analytics and a manual review. So we've been going through all of the modules manually going page by page, actually viewing them as well as taking the analytics out of the system. We've been feeding our feedback back to the module teams. We are reviewing the learning design. <clears throat> we are providing support for staff on, on using learning analytics. Um, and um, we, we want uh, the module teams to present at our learning and teaching, internal learning and teaching events as we progress through the, through the year. So um, shall I? Move on. Yeah. Over to you, Stefan. No, like I said, I think the key things that we're really interested in um, that Kingston is doing with this pod, especially, is obviously seeing what the learning analytics show at you know the end. The pilot mm -hmm. is going to run plan through the whole of this yep. academic year, 
Um, but even in those initial pieces, how does that tie into you know these three themes that we're seeing that students are asking for in you know, really what's important um, to them on the student success and engagement perspective? So I think this is really interesting as well, just what Tim was talking about with you know giving students the ability to to learn and actually write HTML or find out about how accessibility, um, why accessibility is really important, because they said depending on you know specifically the subject matter that they may be going in, they may be going to education for instance mm -hmm. or any sort of design, but no matter what, people need more and more of these types of skills as they go forward into, into the workforce. Um, so I think, like I said, this, like the pilot that Kingston is doing, uh, we're really interested to see how it progresses. And, you know, this year it's 12 modules, you know, is it going to be 400 next and then 1500 the next year? Like how well adopted is that? And is it driving that active engagement that people are looking for? And so I think it's also, um, you know, flipping the idea of Canvas in this instance is you know, very controlled into the, the page editing and the idea of um, the use of discussions. But we're also seeing from other institutions who are, you know, maybe even giving a student a full Canvas course to create. And that's actually their assessment at the end of the year. So throughout the entire year, you're, you're learning, but you're actually taking that learning and applying it into creating a module, once again, maybe the example is you're doing a bachelor's of education, and at the end of the year, what you're showcasing, what's going to be accessed, is the unit structure that you created, and how it aligns to the, you know, the pedagogy model that you want to, to get across. So, like I said, there's some really neat use cases when it comes to um, the flexibility of Canvas and the ideas uh, that University of Kingston has that other institutions where that idea of meeting students where they are and giving them more control over their blended learning experiences um, is, is really important. So right on. We um, wanted to make sure we left lots of times if there's any question or, or, or thoughts, you know, maybe examples of you know, what you're doing at your own institutions um, that you know, align with this model. So, like I said, obviously, questions for Sam or Tim. Any kind of final thoughts before the group? Um, yeah, I just add one. I just add one final thing, which I didn't mention. I didn't think there was time, but we have an institutional strategy bigger than than uh, than tell, uh, uh, but that's focusing on future skills. Uh, I'm sure a lot of institutions are are doing this, and you've referred to it as well, Stefan. Um, so the university has done a lot of research uh, working with industry and has developed some future skills reports, uh, which is published on the university website. But that's been really useful because we've now developed a program um, for all courses in the university that have to implement now. So the university has identified the key skills that it wants our graduates to have in discussions with uh, with industry. Uh, and there are some mandated learning outcomes within the institutions for level four, level five, and level six currently, um, which ties in, which ties in with this, with this work and how students develop those skills as they progress through their learning. Okay, that was that's the only thing I wanted to add. Um, we're just going to take questions and repeat them back to you for our online audience because otherwise they can't hear them. So please do raise your hand and let us know where you're joining us from and um, what questions you have. Yes, please. Um, Fran Harrison from Kilray Group. Um, I was interested to hear about you saying students using the HTML at that goal. Yeah. And how, yeah. How that yeah. Be, so particularly the AI. Yeah. Um, and just expanding digital literacy, so being critical of yeah. the AI. How do you, how you find your students understanding yeah. that? Do you find you're expecting more of them than they can? Issue well, I think I think this is really Sorry, Tim, just for an answer for anyone online. The question is around um, digital skills and the use of uh, HTML, um, but also being critical of maybe uh, discussion topics or themes that have been generated by, by AI. So that was uh, just a repeat of the, the question. Yeah, I, I think that's 
that's really interesting. We'll know, you know, when the students come back, you know, that, that la last year was, was an interesting one for us. Our focus really from the centre. So I'm in a, a central department learning teaching, the Learning and Teaching Enhancement Centre. Um, and our focus was on staff. So in February, basically, we ran a, uh, we ran internal, we had an internal conference event. Um, and then f where AI was quite a lot of discussion, but then from then on, right up till now, we've been running weekly briefing sessions for staff. And we've put a significant online resource for staff on all aspects of AI, particularly in terms of its ethics and biases and all of that side of things. Our focus was really on staff and supporting staff working with, with students. We were in that day, as I think probably everybody was in terms of our assessments being set at the beginning of the academic year and what staff could do in that, in that period. What we're finishing off now is a student phase. So we, we got a, a, um, a unit, we got our education committee and our academic council agree a guidance document for students, which we published for this academic year. It, it, it gives an overview of AI and the university's position on it and how to reference AI in assessments. Um, and we put control in terms of our module leaders. And we're now just finishing off developing a student facing AI resource, which is not just looking at what it is, looking at how you interact, effective prompting, but also being critical, you know, the, the huge number of ethical issues, the environmental impact, the immense number of biases that are in the system. So we're working that through at the moment, but I mentioned this, uh, this future skills program, you know, this a university-wide strategy, we're linking that in. So the digital ca capabilities is linked into that and the AI is linked into that. So we're coming at it from a number, but it's, it's not going to be an easy year. And it's an interesting one from staff perspective we haven't got to all staff I know that I know from the number of people who've attended our webinars and our sessions and conferences and that's a huge challenge for us Ho hopefully that gave you yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, we're always surprised by how advanced some of these are and it's like yeah this is from I've come from a yeah. previously yeah. first background yeah private yeah but how advanced some are and Sometimes the, the gaps in knowledge, you just think yeah. uh, it's a complete curveball where you think we assume they'd know this, but they didn't. Yeah. You have to take several steps exactly. to make sure you've got that foundation. So yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a great follow up point. And just for anyone online, he's really talking about the difference in the digital skills gap, how some students come to university and have very high um, understandings of not only AI, but how to use digital tools, and then on the inverse. Um, there are, are some students that have very low levels of digital skills. And so, you know, there is that um, kind of responsibility to make sure that everyone is at least, you know, on a playing field that they can contribute and benefit from some, yeah. of, the, some of the work that's being done. Yeah. So, no, that's great. Thanks for, thanks for sharing. And I think one of the things, and just to add, is building it in and giving examples of building it into Canvas um, is... We've got the issue, of course, I think everybody faces, maybe you, you're further ahead than we are, but in terms of licensing, licensing these tools and how we can actually use them in, in the classroom. Um, um, one from a staff perspective, but secondly from students. So one way is at least as staff is being able to generate AI output, include it in discussion forums, get students to critique that output and so on. Um, but that's another challenge we face. There's a question over here. Yeah, Yeah. 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 Well, you know, we could say that we could do it, but unless it's sort of work based around it, you know, so, um, yeah, you can never, I think, understand symptoms, you know, for sure, in terms of work, so that's working. Yeah. So, we think, um, yeah, it's right, and have, uh, what more symptoms, that, basically, yeah. students think that way. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just kind of reiterate that point, like said for anyone uh, listening by the request. Um, the, the comment was really around the, the balance between asynchronous and synchronous that we talked about um, and how you know, some specific faculties um, with comments around nursing and midwifery. So um, you know, maybe a program that is very hands-on and has work-based components um, and how it can be tough to rely solely on synchronous, or sorry, asynchronous, because there comes a point where you actually need to, to demonstrate that in, in person. Um, Tim, anything that you kind of want? To yeah, I think that's really important and, and interesting, and, and you uh, relating it to nurse, the nurse courses, because they were the first courses that engaged with us with Flip Canvas. And I, I I met with the module leaders and course uh, and course leaders from nursing last last week, and a really interesting discussion because you know they've been trying you know you know trying to implement effective asynchronous activities and it's been the issue particularly since the pandemic of getting students to engage with those and yeah exactly. And so we've already had some interest, you know, they've tried, you know, tried some of the ideas that we're talking about as to, you know, none, so a lot of this is not new, but they are big challenges we face. We're in a difficult situation that in this post pandemic period. But, you know, we've been discussing with them, you know, consistency through the whole interesting discussion about consistency across the whole program, you know, at level four when the students are first coming in, you know, is actually you know, from day one, starting to get access, uh, to be engaged with uh, asynchronous activities, you know, so they're used to it, it becomes, and across their modules, and they take that through their program. As start, nursing course, very keen, I think it's, in, we also see it as important, is engaging students in this, you know, students from the very beginning, at the starting point, to hear their voice about what we're planning and what the aims are so that's you know so the, the nursing course has been really interesting for us and the challenges they face for the reasons you you said thanks for the question i guess is there any i know we're just past our time um are there any other kind of like thoughts or thoughts or questions from from the group yes okay <laughs> Crikey, that's that's a that's a big one. So we as an institution, may, or last year, well, we we made the decision that we weren't using AI detection last year, and I think that was one of the one of the reasons, of course, probably a, like most universities are facing, you know, the false, the false positive. There's no evidence that you can actually link back to, you know, you just, it's based on an hour, you know, an algorithm. Some of the biases that are now emerging, at least with some of the tools that are out there. I think that's interesting because the anxiety about students in terms of having AI where they think AI is going to be detected, but actually there is no, that you know, they didn't use AI. So the way that we're tackling that is one, the guidance document. We're trying to, you know, give a basis so that students understand what the university policy is in this regard, how they should re how they should reference explicit AI sources, how they should acknowledge AI in contributing towards their assessment, what the rules are that you know this will be determined the AI and its validity in assessment will be determined by the module leader, and they must listen to the module leader. And then, as I say, we're working on this resource that we've got to have out in the next couple of weeks to help students as well and understand the issues. But uh, look, the, we know there's no easy answer to it. We know student anxiety is a, is a, is a major issue, staff an, an anxiety as, as well. Yeah. Do 
you know what? It's in it's internal currently. That's how it was published. But I, I think we can probably share it. It's probably not dissimilar to probably what a lot of institutions have put out. You know, we trawl. I trawl, I attended. I, you know, I attended webinars all over the, the online. It's been brilliant. Uh, webinars all over the world, and particularly really interesting practice in Nos, particularly in Australia. Some really interesting stuff coming out of Canada, the US, and so I looked at. And now that some of the referencing styles have now finally, you know, built AI into those, that's helped APA and Harvard. So Cite Them Right is we use at Kingston. So we built it around that in terms of, of referencing. Um, and then a statement, you know, just about, you know, if you've used AI, I mean, we're into interesting territory, the whole hybrid writing, you know, is anything not going to have AI in it? But this year, students, if they use AI in any form, even if it doesn't explicitly appear, they, we're asking them to acknowledge it and write uh, in the And so that's the... I know, I know. <laughs> Do you know, we don't have, there's not an easy answer. We're discussing that with staff now, you know, you, you know, students using Grammarly Go and, you know, the, the tool advising them on a, the structure of a sentence, you know. Yeah, it becomes, it becomes to encompass everything. If yeah. You're going that, um, that granular. Right? Yeah. It's very difficult. But I think there's a bias there as well. That work that was done at Stanford, I think, on bias in in AI detection, uh, you know, um, and saying particularly identifying um, in the tools at least they ex they examined um, bias uh, against students where English was not their first language, and I think that's that then that's another real dimension in in you know the granular advice from an AI engine. So it's, yeah, we, we've got to continue to work in that, in that space. Okay. No. You're welcome to continue the conversation um, in the next half an hour, if you're not moving to another session, but I am mindful that yeah. the other yes. half an hour sessions yeah. might continue. So if you do want to go into the other rooms, we'll, um, we'll wrap up the official Q and A, but obviously the conversation can continue. Sounds good. Yeah, so like I said, for anyone who um, is taking off, obviously, Thanks for thanks for joining. I think uh, what will you know be potentially a nice follow up um, is we actually are running our uh, Canvas Connect event on the first of November, where Tim and Daryl will be presenting a little bit further into into this pilot. So this is a this is a free event. Um, it's once again hosted on the first of November in Liverpool, um, and uh, along with Kingston, we're going to have speakers from. Universities of Liverpool, Anglia Ruskin, um, and you know a number of other kind of interesting panels, industry experts as well. So, like I said, a bit of a bit of a follow up session on this, and yeah, I hope everyone has a great couple of days talking about um, everything learning technology here at the University of Warwick. Thank you.